Hi everybody. This is uh, a little bit awkward since I'm talking to myself, but here goes. Um, some important things to remember about the oboe and the bassoon. I'm going to start with reeds <coughs> because um, reeds control 80% of the oboe and the bassoon's function. With the oboe in particular, there's just no possible way really to make the instrument longer or shorter without having a different reed. Yes, you can pull the reed out of the well and it will make a little bit of a difference, but what it will do is it will throw everything else off uh, intonation-wise. So things that were sharp may come down a little bit, but notes that were flat will be even flatter. So you want to avoid um, trying to tune the oboe by making it longer or shorter. Pulling the bell out makes no difference, and you'll see in a few minutes when we do the assembly that if you do that, um, the bridges won't connect. Same thing with the middle joint. So the basic premise here is that you have to um, have a reed that works and a reed that's in tune and is easy enough. Um, so in terms of reeds, response is always primary, okay, and, and then tone. So if it's a little soft but it's in tune and it responds, that's more important than having a big, beautiful, dark sound um, when you're dealing with oboe players. Uh, bassoon players is very similar. You want to make sure that the reed responds, and one of the ways that you can test the reed is to do what we call crowing, C-R-O-W-I-N-G. And I've got a bunch of reeds here that I'm going to demonstrate. Um, with oboe and bassoon, <clears throat> um, each one of them has a little bit of a different crow, something that you're looking with, looking for. So with the bassoon, you want a good mixture of partials, high, medium, and low. So I have no idea what this other reed's going to do, but I was trying this one a little bit earlier. And if you're too firm with your embouchure, all you'll get is something like this. If you notice, if I loosen up the center of my lips a little bit, you'll start to hear more uh, overtones in the sound, more partials in the sound. If I'm too open, and my lips are too far apart, and my, my, my throat is too open, all you'll hear is lows. So, what you want is a good mixture of high, medium, and low partials. Okay? So that's what you're listening for with bassoon. Not a particular pitch, uh, but just a good mixture of high, medium, and low partials. So you see you have a little more highs in that sound. And that's okay, it will probably work. Um, but that's what you're looking for with oboe. Uh, with bassoon, excuse me. With oboe, you're actually looking for a particular pitch. And if you get a tuner out or whatever you're using in your classroom, and you play a fourth space C, let's see if I can get this to work here. So there's a C. What you're listening for with oboe reeds, and I have no idea what my reeds are doing today, is you're almost looking for a double octave C or something close. When you crow the oboe, this is very important, uh, playing position is not the same as crowing position. On the bassoon it should be, so you should have about two-thirds of the reed to three-quarters of the reed down to the wire on the bassoon in your mouth. So you want to be about this far on, on the reed. With the oboe, when you crow it, when you crow the oboe reed, you want to, be, you want to have your lips on the string, right where the string meets the, the cane. Okay, but that's not playing position. Playing position is about half of the bark part of the reed. Okay? So on the oboe, when you crow it, you want to listen for that double octave C. Now I've lost my C's. My C sound. So you can tell that's a little bit flat. That's actually where I traditionally make my reeds, is maybe about a quarter step or close to it, eighth of a step. Uh, below C because that's what works for my embouchure. But do you also hear that's a perfect double octave. Okay, so this is a good read. I'm about to save this for my tour this week. I bet I've got a, a mixture, a variety of read sounds though. Here, that one has a few more partials in it. Now if you hear that, that's terribly flat. Okay, so you can look at the read and say, oh my goodness, it's pretty open, so you can squeeze down the bottom. You have to make sure it's really wet before you do that. That should bring it up a little bit. 
hear the difference in the sound? So that's one way you can fix a read is if it's too open. If it's too closed, it's pretty much hopeless. You better start over. Pretty good. So they're all pretty consistent, which is obviously what I'm going for as a reed maker is to make pretty consistent reeds. But you did hear that one that's flat. So if you were to put that reed on the oboe, it's going to be really flat in pitch. So you can hear and tell a lot from the crow. You know, if, you're, if your oboe player is super, super flat, it's probably the reed. <clears throat> um, you know, unless their armature is too super loose and not enough airflow, which is obviously sort of like emergency medicine. You always want to check breathing first and the air, the air uh, control that they have. So you can always go for that first. But then after that, very soon after that, with the oboe bassoon, you want to check the reed. So pretty good. All pretty good. So we had a couple reeds here that were a little funky. But um, like I said, you can, um, you can um, look at the opening of the reed. It makes a big difference sometimes. I wanted to show you, I'll get a little closer to the camera. That I don't know how many of you have seen that uh, what an actual reed looks like before it's made. Um, so this is the top part of the cane plant, and as it gets lower, the the bottom part of the cane, the diameter increases. So you know you've got oboe reeds up here, and then as you go down, you maybe have English horn reeds, then clarinet reeds, then saxophone reeds. So the bigger the reed, the lower, the bigger the diameter of the cane. So what happens is, is I split this into three pieces. And then I cut it down to the eventual size of the oboe reed, and it's pretty thick at this point. So then I run it through what's called a gouging machine. Um, and this is all machine-made process for people who are making machine-made reeds, you know, that sell them in bulk. Obviously, I do everything by hand. Um, and then once it's cut down or gouged to size, and this is within a hundredth of a millimeter we're talking about here, then you score it and fold it over, wrap it on the staple, which is the cork part, and then you have to clip it and then, of course, scrape it. You guys aren't going to do that, okay? So the one thing I think you need, the couple things that you need to have as a band director if you're playing, uh, if you have double reeds playing in your studio <coughs> or in your ensemble, you want to have what's called a plaque. I'm going to get close to the camera here. So it's just a little silver thing. It's very, very thin. All right, and what this does is it sticks in between the blades of the reed. They have these for bassoon, too. You stick it in between the blades of the reed very carefully, obviously. And you can tell a lot about the reed by looking at it. If you see a giant split down the middle of the reed, then obviously you know why it's not working. Okay, you'll be able to see cracks at the tip, which is really typical of beginning students. Because they're not careful and they hit it on their teeth or they hit it on the stand and so forth. Reeds are very, very delicate, particularly oboe reeds. But soon reeds are a little more hardy, so that's kind of nice. Um, but you should all have a plaque, P A, excuse me, P L A Q U E. All right, and they make these for oboes and bassoons. So this is a dollar, one dollar. The other thing I would suggest, I mean, you can get a knife if you want to, a double reed knife, like a double hollow ground knife. Sure, if you know what you're doing. If you don't, you can probably just make it worse. But the other thing I would suggest to have is some sandpaper. Because if you have a plaque, you can stick this in if the reed is just super hard for them. You can take some really uh, 220 grit uh, sandpaper and just really lightly sand the whole reed down. Do this with bassoon, certainly. And you can also do it with clarinet and saxophone reeds if they're really hard. Um, you can sand them down. So the plaque and the sandpaper are the two things I would recommend uh, in terms of maintenance of reeds. Yes, you can get a tip clipper uh, for clarinet and saxophone reeds, but you have to use that very sparingly. Um, if it's super flat, you have to cut the smallest amount off uh, in order to make the reed a little sharper. Same thing with oboe bassoon, you would need a cutting block and then of course some razor blades um, before you could do that. The thing I want to make sure that you understand with oboe bassoon is that the reed controls the intonation. With bassoon, you can buy smaller or longer or shorter vocals to adjust the overall sound of the instrument. Same thing with English horn. Um, you can get a different vocal size to make the instrument flatter or sharper. But with oboe, you really can't. You know, you can adjust it here, but that's not a good idea. All right, so you don't want to do that. Um, so you want to get a reed that's really good and in tune for your students. Super important. So pitch, the pitch of the reed, and then the response. 
If you're blowing on it and nothing comes out, and then it sort of hesitates, I probably told you the reed is a little too hard. It should, when you res it should respond immediately when you're crowing it. Um, you shouldn't have to force a ton, ton of air. Uh, that means the, 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 the reed is probably a little too hard. Okay? In terms of where to buy reeds. You know, if you're in a, in a town like Indiana, the first person I would call would be me or Dr. Worsbitt um, to say, you know, A, do you make reeds and do you sell them? I, I sell reeds to the high school and the junior high school in Indiana sometimes, or my students have on, on uh, occasion. So if you're near a college or university has a music program, that's a good resource for you because handmade reeds are better. Than, they're more consistent, as you can see when I demonstrated it. Um, than the machine-made reeds are. You've seen that in class. When I hand out six machine-made reeds, four, three or four of them are okay, and then three of them are practically useless. So, you know, 50% or a little more, uh, they've gotten a little better over the years, is not a great um, average. And not only that, they're very expensive. Compared to a clarinet or saxophone reed, they're double or triple the price. Um, places like Woodwind and Brasswind certainly have reeds. Um, you can get them from local music stores. My, my two favorite brands of uh, oboe and bassoon reeds are Jones. And you know the Jones reeds because uh, they, have red, um, they have red thread. So the bassoon and the oboe reeds have red thread. Um, with, and then Fox Renard, R-E-N-A-R-D, makes uh, decent oboe and bassoon reeds. They're a little more expensive. But there are tons and tons of double reed shops out there online that you could look at and price student reads. Sometimes you can get a discount if you buy 10 or more if you've got that kind of budget in your school. Um, so, but the biggest thing is to, is to make sure that they have a read that's working so that they're in tune and that they are able, able to play easily. Then the other thing you really have to take time with with oboe bassoon players is care of the read. Um, as I said to you, the, the tip of the oboe reed is extremely thin. Those of you who haven't played it yet, you'll notice. You know, one little tiny chip on your teeth and the reed is done. You know, there goes $10 or, or more in some cases. So you really have to impress upon your oboe students that they have to be very, very careful. They have to have a good case. Obviously, you're not going to have a case like mine, you know, uh, a $90 case. But they do make cases like this that, are, that have three reed cases that are plastic that are super cheap. So I would encourage you to get them one of those rather than having them put them in these little plastic containers. These are not airtight, so that's good because they won't mold when you put them in there wet. Um, but the OBO little cylinder containers for the OBO reeds, I've seen so many students just uh, chip their reed because um, they were having the OBOs. So um, there you go. All right. Um, all right, I'm going to start with bassoon and then... I'm going to go over assembly with bassoon again to make sure that you know how name know all the names of the parts because the bassoon is probably the most tricky to um, to put together. So with bassoon, I know you probably can't see the case on the floor, so I'll hold the parts up. The first thing you need to do is take the seat strap out and put it on the chair. Okay, that way when the students are assembling, they don't have to fool around with getting the seat strap set when they've got the whole long bassoon in their arms. The cup or the hook always goes to the right hand side of the chair. And you want it to be on the front third, the front third of the chair. You're going to sit with your back all the way to the back of the chair. That's the one difference with bassoon. This isn't a great chair, um, but I will try and sit back in it. Um, that's the one difference with bassoon and all the other woodwind instruments is, you know, you don't want them sitting with their back of their chair on the flute or when they play the oboe. You want them up and sitting up with their torso. Um, and away from the back of the chair. Saxophone is really important for all the reasons we've described with them sitting it on the chair, resting it on the chair, and not having the neck strap in the correct place. Okay, so the first piece is the boot, like a footwear boot, the boot joint. When you assemble the bassoon, just remember holes with holes, keys with keys. All right, so the boot joint is first, and it has two holes. You want to fill the smaller one first with what's called um, the tenor joint or the wing joint, like a bird's wing, W-I-N-G. Grab it very carefully out of the case, and remember, hold it here in this wooden part, and then you can really easily twist it. This part I would do on my lap, okay? When we get to the other stage, we'll put it in the case. So small twisting motions. 
It's not a bad idea if you get a brand new bassoon to mark. This bassoon has two little marks right here, one in the metal and then one on the wood, to where it's supposed to line up. But the important thing is that the bridge lines up over top of this other bridge key. And then if you have a whisper key lock, that it is down and not engaged. So you want to look for that. Again, holes with holes, keys with keys, okay, front to back. Holes go away from you or in the front side. So the next piece is the bass joint or the long joint, okay? And it really just sort of snugs up right here beside the other joint. Now, this bassoon has had its lock removed, but there's almost always a lock right here in between the two pieces, which is a hole. It actually had it removed for whatever reason. Uh, and then you make sure that that's locked. And it basically keeps the pieces from moving, but this one's pretty snug. So maybe that's why they removed the lock, okay? At this point, I would put the bassoon on the ground or in the case, uh, and then you want to grab the bell, which is next. <coughs> Push the button down on the bell, and then it goes over top of this long piece on the long joint. Okay, keep your hands off the long rods, and you'll be golden. Okay, you don't really have to push the button, but I think it's good practice to go ahead and do that. All right. At this point, you can either have them hook it up, whatever seems to work best for you, or put the vocal on. Just be careful when you're in a band room that's really tight, that when they put the vocal on and they're trying to hook it up to the seat strap, they're not poking their friend's eye out next to them. Very important. Okay, so um, the vocal has a hole on it, B-O-C-A-L. The vocal has a hole on it, which is covered by the whisper keypad right here, okay? Now I'm doing a no-no. Whenever you pick up the bassoon, you want to pick it up from the boot joint because these pieces are notoriously um, loose on some bassoons and they'll just pull right out and then you drop the bassoon. Hold the vocal here, not on here on the cork end, and certainly not at the very thin metal at the very end. So right in the crook of the vocal. Then make sure it's greased up if it's got a cork. And then it goes right in. Now we'll talk about posture in just a second. But you want to make sure the whisper key lock is not engaged because then this whisper key will let the pad move very freely. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, so this hole on the vocal right here has to be covered by the whisper, whisper key pad. Okay, and you can adjust the vocal as you need to otherwise. Okay, so you're ready to play. You're going to have the back against the chair. All right, you're going to put the seat strap on. Some has the cup variety like this one where it just slides over the boot joint, and then some have a hook, okay? When you're using the hook variety of seat strap, make sure that you hook it down, like the hook is facing like this, not upwards, and then put it on the closest hook to you, so the one closest to your body. The cup ones are really nice because they work easily and you don't have to worry about it. They just slide right on over, okay? okay. So with posture, is super important on the bassoon. Seat strap on the front corner of the chair. The bassoon comes across your body like a half an X. See how I can stare right at the camera, all right? I'm not like this. This is how bassoonists play. They're like looking out of one side of their mouth because they've got the bassoon too far over here. Okay, across your body, just like a half an X. Seat strap on the front corner of the chair. Then if you're sitting up with your back against the chair, if you lean the bassoon forward, you should bring it right here to the divot of your chin. This is a tiny bit low, so I'll adjust the seat strap. Try again. And my head is straight, but you want it to hit you in the divot of the chin, okay? And then you're just going to dip your head slightly. What that does is it actually creates the overbite, which is what the bassoon embouchure sort of looks like when you're playing, at least. With oboe bassoon, the embouchure is made the same way. Okay, they're both what we call double lip embouchures, which means both lips are rolled in over the teeth. Unlike the clarinet and saxophone, which are single lip embouchures, bottom lip is rolled in on clarinet and sax, top teeth rests on the mouthpiece, but it's not rolled in. Okay, so when both lips rolled in, what's important to remember is the same embouchure formation as the other reed instruments. Okay, you want to use that long drawn out Q syllable, which brings the chin flat, brings the corners forward and firm. All right, but the center of your lips has to be really loose. Dr. Wordswood always does this really cool thing when he does uh, the bassoon embouchure. This is how loose the lips have to be 
Everything else is firm, okay? But when you're playing the bassoon, read. You should be able to literally to move the reed side to side in your lips. Oboe doesn't really work that way. It's a little firmer in the center of the lips than the bassoon. But what, why you have to keep the center of the lips um, open and, and pillow-like is what I always describe it as. Is because you'll close the blades of the reed if you don't. Okay, so the bassoon embouchure is a little bit firmer, I'm the, a little bit looser than the oboe. You don't necessarily move the oboe reed around, but that's usually because it's so much smaller. That's really why. Okay, the surface area is smaller. Okay, so that's the difference between the oboe and the bassoon embouchure. So just remember when you're doing the double reed embouchure, both lips are rolled in over the teeth. Okay, it looks like a whistle, except the lips aren't puckered out. Drawstring bag analogy works really well. So on bassoon, make sure it comes to this. Then when you dip your head, you can see that you have, it looks like you have a little bit of an overbite. That's what you want on the bassoon, okay? Okay, it works. All right, let me consult my notebook here, make sure I'm covering everything that we need here. Okay. So in terms of balance and hand position for bassoon, we've talked about posture. If you get that posture right, you're going to be okay. So the left hand thumb, it goes on what we call the whisper key, which is the bottom key on the right hand side, okay? That's sort of like home base for your left hand thumb. Then your index finger, third finger, fourth finger just cover the holes. Uh, people when they play the bassoon, uh, they complain a lot about the left hand. If the seed strap is in the right place, it really shouldn't be that heavy on your left hand, okay? If you're really trying to hold it up, but the seat strap really takes a lot of the weight off of the instrument. In terms of the right hand, there's a big pancake key here, okay, I hope you can see it. Then the one above it is what we call the B-flat key, so that's, you're gonna be using that a lot. But you have to make stu sure students are not pushing it down all the time when they're not, when they're not supposed to. That's one big thing you see with technique on the bassoon. Okay, so your thumb's going to operate all of these back here, and then your left thumb's going to operate all these other keys for the low notes, and then we'll talk about flicking in just a minute. Uh, then your right hand just fits index 3, 4 on the holes. The important thing to remember about bassoon is there are, you see hole 1, hole 2, then you have two keys. You're going to skip this middle key, just like a little bis key, and then put your fourth finger on the longer key. Okay, so just remember to have them skip that key. When they play in there. Okay, so um, just make sure that they try and keep their hands curved. With bassoon, in particular, on the right hand, they feel like they don't have anywhere to put their thumb, and so it's unstable. So what you'll see is they'll play with really flat fingers a lot of the time. Okay, so make sure that they have a really nice curve. The th the right hand thumb should hover. It really shouldn't be placed on the wood above the keys, and it shouldn't be, certainly shouldn't be putting the B-flat key down. But you can keep your hand curved um, and do that at the same time. They do make something called a crutch. This one had a crutch, but it's been removed. It's a piece that's uh, it's usually got a hole for it on most bassoons, and it's a little thing that sticks out about this far from the instrument, and it actually is somewhere to put your hand. So student, young students sometimes find the crutch helpful, but if they have small hands, a crutch uh, will make it worse because they'll be further from the holes and they'll have trouble covering them, okay? So um, a crutch is just what it, what it sounds like. It helps with hand position. <coughs> it makes it easier for them. <coughs> okay, um, balance points, whisper key, where to put right thumbs. Okay, we talked about armature. One of the things that you're gonna hear on bassoon sometimes is, I don't know if it'll do it while I'm playing today, but if you hear the sound when they're playing and it sounds like a helicopter is going that, 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 that's water in the vocal. So what you do is you take the vocal off, take the reed off, and then you blow from the cork end out. There was actually some, something gross in there. I don't know whose bassoon this is. But um, so I got that out of there, which will mean the water won't get stuck, which will mean you, you'll avoid that sound. But if you ever hear that sound when you're doing teaching the bassoon or if you've got a student in the class and they're going, what the heck is that? Try blowing the water out of the vocal. It's just like a brass spit valve. It has to be emptied every now and then. They actually make vocal brushes, which I recommend very highly for your students because gross stuff 
builds up in there. So you want to get the bogle brush and clean it out either every time or at least every two or three times um, when you're playing. Okay. Um, so the big two things with technique on the bassoon, you know, you're going to have them start on real simple like D, with this, which is whisper key one, two. Piece of cake, right? D, C, B flat are really easy notes to get them started on. Sooner rather than later, they're going to end up having to do half old G, which is fourth space G in the bass clef. So as we've done in class, the easiest way to have them do this, okay, is to walk down to the low G from like a D or a C. Make sure they're really confident with the low G before they have they add the half hole. Okay, I'm going to get up and show you in just a second, but. The three-step process is basically, you know, have them walk down to the low G and be confident with that, okay? Keep the whisper key down, and then with the same air and embouchure, maybe a little tiny bit of more air speed, because sometimes they'll back off. So with a touch more air speed, but the same embouchure, they're, all they're going to do is they're going to rock the left-hand index finger down, okay? There's no plateau key like on the oboe, all right? So you're just going to open the hole about halfway, okay? You'll hear it when it's not open enough because it will crack. So have them walk down. If it's not open enough, it'll sound, you heard me crack it once. Hear that noise? That tells me the half hole's not open enough. So when, that, when it's sort of cracking between the octaves, it's usually because it's not open enough, okay? You can have them do the same thing with uh, F sharp and A flat, which are the other two. The main thing I want you to remember here is the motion, okay? It's a rocking motion. You want to rock your index finger down, okay? You don't want to slide it, but it needs to, you need to be able to see it moving, okay? I hope you can see that on the camera, okay? So you can have them do that with F sharp and A. Right? Same process. Walk down to the low one and then open the half hole. Push a little more air and you'll have it. Piece of cake. Then the break on the bassoon is actually F to G. F is just whisper key, one finger. Okay? And then you gotta go to all fingers down and the half hole. So that's really the break on the bassoon. So you're gonna want to get them started you know, getting a, comfortable with the octave and then have them try and just play the G half hole by themselves. Or at least their fingers, try it again. Then, just like with clarinet, you must have the fingers close to the keys, okay, in order to um, achieve the break easily on the bassoon. So the break actually occurs between F and F sharp on the bassoon because that's the first half hole note is F sharp or G flat. So that's technically where the break is. But you're gonna in practice, just like with clarinet going A to B, 